Hey everyone, today we are going to start module three, which are the body systems, and we're going to start with the nervous system. So here's nervous system part one. And before we start, I just kind of want to look at this little diagram here to explain. This is, it goes over this in your pre lecture, but this is just it in picture form, I guess. So your central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord, and it's usually abbreviated CNS. So think of it as being central. It's down the center of your body. You've got your brain and your spinal cord. And then there is the peripheral nervous system. So if you think of the word peripheral, like peripheral vision or whatever, it's, it's off to the side. And so this is like all the nerves that branch off from the spinal cord. So, when there is a stimulus that usually is, goes into the peripheral nervous system, some of the nerves outside of the central nervous system sense this, and we call these sensory neurons, which makes sense. And then that message is sent to the central nervous system, whether it's to um, just the spinal cord or all the way to the brain. And then the type of neurons in the central nervous system are called interneurons. And they kind of integrate the message and then send it where it needs to go, usually to motor neurons in the peripheral nervous system. And then this elicits some sort of response, whether it's um, the stimulus is sent to a muscle or a gland or what's the other thing, organs. Um, yeah, so there's a, a brief overview of that. And we'll look down here at our question of the day. Can eating puffer fish, and I could be pronouncing this wrong, fugu sushi kill you? It's kind of a random question, but we'll find out. Don't think we need to go over anything here, but make sure you have gone through all of this and that you know what all of these things are. And let's jump in right here. So let's start with talking about neurons. So neurons, it's basically a nerve cell. It's the type of cells that make up the nervous system. And there are three different types. So right here, we've got a sensory neuron. You can see it looks kind of different. It's got its nucleus and cell body right here. Um, and then this right here would be an interneuron that you would find in the central nervous system. And then this would be a motor neuron. So on tests and things like that, um, like when you think of a, a neuron, this is typically what you'll see. In fact, you guys know I'm a dork, but a neuron is my favorite type of cell, and so I have one tattooed on my ankle, and it looks just like this. So that's like the classic neuron you'll see. If you're asked to label a neuron on the test, it will look like this. Um, some parts you should know about, and this camera doesn't zoom in as well as my old one did. I kind of like the old one better, but we'll deal with it. And then I have to manually focus it. I feel like I'm focusing a microscope. All right, that's still kind of hard to see, but you guys should have your paper. So um, just like all the other cells in your body, your the neurons have like organelles and a nucleus and all those things. And those are found here in the cell body. Uh, these little finger-like projections are called dendrites, and they're going to receive signals from the interneurons or from other neurons. And then you have this long part here, it's called the axon. And that's really where we're gonna focus today is what happens on and in the axon. And the axon is wrapped in these little insulating cells, these little light blue guys here. And it's called myelin, it's the myelin sheath. And here it's showing a little cross section right here, but this would be the axon. And then it's wrapped in, in this insulating cell. Um, called myelin. And there are little spaces in between the myelin, and those are called nodes of Ranvier. And we'll 
talk about what all of this is for throughout the lecture today. So the axon, this part here, may be insulated and protected by myelin sheaths. So not all of them are. Um, it might be best here if we zoom back out. Okay, so glial cells which is another type of nervous tissue that we won't really discuss in class. Wrap the axons in myelin. So there are going to be some glial cells that come along and wrap these, they're, they're called Schwann cells, I don't think you need to know that, but they wrap it around the myelin. And in the central nervous system, you have two types of tissue, there's gray matter and white matter. So the gray matter, matter has no myelin wrapped around the axon, and white matter does have myelin. So apparently these cells are white in color and so if they contain myelin it's the white matter and if there is no myelin it's going to be gray matter so now these spaces in between the nodes of Ranvier are the exposed axon between the myelin And these are found in both neurons and muscles. So this myelin is important because, like, like I said, it ins it's an insulator for the axon, and nerve impulses. At the basic level, all it is is diffusion, okay, the movement of ions. And so it's sent as an electrical, an electrochemical signal. And so if you have that insulation there, it helps the, the message to move faster. And we'll talk exactly about exactly how that works. I think it's on the last page, but um, know that a nerve in your body is a bundle of neurons so a whole bunch of these guys bundled together and we're going to talk about something called nerve impulses and those are the electrical chemical signals that convey information So resting potential, and we're talking about what's happening here in the axon from here on out, until I say otherwise. <laughs> so the resting potential is when the axon is at rest. Meaning it's not currently sending a signal. It's just chilling.
And when it does this, when it's at rest, its charge is negative 70 millivolts. And to find that charge, basically this is representing the axon right here, really blown up obviously. You would take a um, some sort of electrode sensor and you would test the charge inside of the axon compared to the charge outside. Here's my little, I don't know, what do they look like? Electrical sensor and inside is negative, a negative 70 compared to the outside. So it asks here, why does it contain a negative charge? That's because there are, and there's, there's more to it than this, but what you need to know for this class is there are negatively charged proteins that are found all over inside the axon. And so that's going to give it an overall negative charge. And if you want to add those to your picture and write negative proteins, or inside, that's why we have an overall negative charge, negative 70 millivolts. And again, we found this just by comparing the inside of the axon to the outside to find the voltage difference. Okay, now this is really cool to me, and when I first took physiology, this was the first time I had ever heard of an action potential or a nerve impulse, and it just blew my mind, literally, that um, everything that you are sensing, feeling, doing, it's all just a result of, and I don't want to say it's simple because the process is complicated, but what it boils down to, it's just diffusion. It's the movement of ions. And that is just crazy to me that that's what is everything that's happening inside of you. I, I can't put it into words. Um, maybe after I explain this, that will make sense. But um, we're going to look at what sodium is doing when the axon is at rest and potassium. So sodium ions are Na+, plus, they're positively charged. And potassium is K, it's also positively charged. And at rest, sodium is located outside the plas plasma membrane of an axon. So we see sodium here lined up outside. And the axon has these voltage-gated sodium channels right here that are closed when the axon is at rest. So remember when we learned about simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion and active transport? We're going to talk about all of those things here. So since sodium is a charged ion, it can't just cross through the plasma membrane on its own, through the cell membrane. So it's stuck outside and it needs a helper to get through. So it's going to get through through facilitated diffusion, diffusion through this sodium gated channel here. So axon has voltage gated and that just means it's triggered by a specific voltage. You'll learn more about this in physiology. Voltage, 
gated sodium channels, which are closed, but will open if there is a voltage change. Okay, so we've got our axon here. It's at rest. It's at negative 70 millivolts. It's got sodium chilling on the outside. This gated channel is closed, so no sodium is moving. And let's look at what the potassium is doing at rest. So these are located inside the axon. and it's in the cytoplasm. The axon also has potassium-gated channels. Since these can't freely pass, they're charged ions, so they need a, a helper to get in and out of the cell. So we have these potassium-gated channels, and at rest, they're also closed. And same thing, they're closed, but will open. If there is a voltage change. So one more time, I know I'm being repetitive, but you guys really need to know this. This axon is at rest. It's at negative 70 millivolts because we have these negative proteins inside. So more, more negative inside compared to outside the cell. We've got sodium outside the cell. We've got potassium inside the cell. You have this gate that can open and allow the sodium ions to come in. And you have this gate that can open, open and let the potassium ions go out, which I, spoiler alert, that's what's going to happen. And this over here, the sodium potassium pump, that'll be important later. So we're not going to talk about this one quite yet. All right, so an action potential. And this is sometimes called a nerve impulse. I think action potential, I feel like that's kind of an older term used for it. I don't know. But action potential nerve impulse is the process of conducting a nerve impulse down the length of the, of the axon. And something to know is that action potentials are all or nothing. So what this means is that if there's a signal arriving at the neuron, must be large enough or there will be no action potential. So basically, if you were to graph an action potential and see what the voltage is doing in the axon at that place on the axon at the time it is having an action potential, it's going to look like this every single time. So we don't have little action potentials or just small changes in voltage. Uh, if there is a small change in voltage, it's not going to cause an action potential or a nerve impulse. Okay, so it's all or nothing. It will look like this every time or there will not be a nerve impulse.
sorry, my camera froze. I don't know what happened. I hope I hope this is good still. Okay, so um, when we have an action potential, the first thing that happens is called depolarization. During depolarization, these sodium gates open. So whoop, this opens, and now the sodium, just because of the random movement of molecules, will diffuse from high to low concentration. From high to low concentration. Remember, if it's going from high to low concentration, it doesn't require the input of energy or ATP, but it's we're calling it facilitated diffusion because sodium needs the help of this protein channel to get into the axon, into the cell. And so what will happen is sodium diffuses from outside the axon where there are more sodium ions to inside where they are less. Sorry, I need to write more clearly with this camera, I think. And what this will do is it's going to, if you're adding, you're having positively charged ions come in, it's going to make the inside of the axon more positive and it's gonna go up to positive 35 millivol millivolts. And this is honestly a, a simplified version of the process. If you take physiology, you'll get all the dirty details. But for now, all you need to know is with depolarization, these gates open, sodium rushes in. So um, here we're at our resting, which is negative 70 millivolts. And sodium rushes in up to, and I know it looks like, it's almost to 40, but this is 35 plus 35 millivolts. And that's where we're at right now. Okay, depolarization, these gates open, sodium rushes inside the axon from high to low concentration until we get to positive 35 millivolts. That's depolarization. The next part of the action potential is going to be called repolarization. So with repolarization, those sodium gates, this is going to close, so sodium can no longer go in or out. those potassium gates will open. Squeeze this in here. Potassium gates open. And so guess what potassium is gonna do? It's gonna diffuse from high to low concentration through that gate. So you're going to see potassium diffusing from inside the axon to outside.
And now since we have these positive charges leaving the cell, it's going to make inside of the axon more negative. All right, so the sodium has rushed in in depolarization. We went up to a, a, a positive 35 millivolts inside here. These gates closed. Now sodium's no longer moving anywhere. The potassium gates open, and so potassium diffuses out. And as we lose those um, positive charges, it becomes more negative inside the axon. Back to negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so now we're all mixed up. We've got all the sodium inside, we've got all the potassium outside, and right now we're in something called the refractory period. So this is a brief period when that patch of axon cannot have another action potential. All right, so the way that this works, and it's kind of confusing to think about, but the action potential propagates down the axon like this. And so we're just looking at a small snapshot of one piece of an axon that's, that's currently undergoing an action potential, and then it's going to move along to the next section. Okay, and then it propagates all the way down the axon, down the nerves to wherever it's, wherever it's going. So before I can have another action potential, the ions, that just moved all around must be reset to what they look like at rest. And that's where our glorious sodium potassium pump comes in, right here. And so its job is to reset the ions after an action potential back to its resting state. So this is going to allow the, ax the axon to have another action potential. We want our neurons to be able to continue continuously um, sending nerve impulses, and so we've got to reset it. Allows axon to have another action potential. Gonna abbreviate that. So, what needs to happen is we need to pump sodium ions back outside. And we need to pump the potassium ions back inside. And this is so simplified compared to physiology. You guys, if you're taking physiology, just wait. I love it though, this is good stuff. So the way um, it's going to reset 
is the sodium potassium pump is going to pump uh, pot potassium ions back in and it's going to pump the sodium ions out. And this is a type of active transport. So it requires energy, requires ATP. Remember, ATP is like the energy currency of the cell. Um, it's, it's what we're trying to make in cellular respiration. It's why you eat and breathe so we can break down those glucose bonds to make ATP. And 30%. Where should I put this? Thirty percent, one third of all of the cell's energy of the ATP is used by these dang little pumps, just resetting the neurons back to normal. Pretty crazy. All right, so I hope we're okay with that. Let's look at. Did it go? When I'm done with the page, I just throw it, and then I don't know where it ended up. Here it is. Okay, so with repolarization, the sodium moves outside the axon through those sodium, or I'm sorry, the potassium moves outside the axon through those potassium-gated channels. And now repolarization, as those positive charges move out, this right here is where the refractory period is, and then we get back to our resting potential where we can have another action potential. I hope we're good so far. Guys, my computer keeps pausing itself. I hope it's not looking weird on your end. Um, let's see. So, Based on what you have learned about how neurons conduct action potentials, imagine that you have this laboratory and you can invent a new drug that manages pain. So how does your drug work and what part of the action potential does it affect? And there's no right or wrong answer here. I mean, obviously there are certain drugs that they use that work a certain way, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you can do anything to stop any part of that process, I'll give you a second to think. You can pause it. Okay, we're back. So um, you could make it so the sodium potassium pumps don't work. To reset it back to have another action potential, you could block uh, the sodium gates or the potassium gates so sodium can't come in, potassium can't get out. Um. There are a couple of drugs, you've probably heard of one, but not the other, that block those sodium voltage-gated channels, which prevents action potentials from starting, because that's where depo uh, depolarization starts is when um, the sodium rushes in. And one you've probably heard of is lidocaine. So when you go to the dentist, usually, as far as I know, um, what they inject to numb you is Novocaine, which it ends in cane, so I'm assuming it, it, I'm assuming it has the same sort of mechanism of action. But before they'll give you a shot, they'll rub that gross-tasting stuff inside your mouth to numb up the area that they're going to, to give the shot to. So this is a local anesthetic. And you can even find this in, like, aloe vera to help block the pain from sunscreen, or they even have it that you can rub on sore, in um, creams that you can rub on sore muscles. But this can be applied topically or injected. It's not very long lasting.
and it only blocks action potentials in a small area. So there's one example. You block those sodium voltage gated channels. Sodium can't rush in. You can't have an action potential. You can't send a nerve impulse. You can't feel pain. In a small area, doesn't last very long. Another is called TTX, and this stuff is rad. It stands for, probably going to say it wrong, tetrodotoxin. And this is a toxin found in certain fish. For example, our good friend, the puffer fish. And what this does is in even the smallest amount, it causes widespread paralysis. So it's likely taking effect there on the motor neurons. And, the thing with it is, it doesn't affect the sensory neurons, so you can still feel, but you can't move. And I believe, I don't know exactly when or where, but there were some indigenous people that would put this on the tips of their arrows, and so they would shoot you with their arrow, and you just need the tiniest amount in your body. It's going to cause widespread paralysis, and so you're paralyzed, you can't move, but you can feel everything. And that doesn't sound like a good way to go out to me. <laughs> and what will eventually happen is it paralyzes your breathing muscles. And if you can't breathe, you're going to die. So you need muscles in... Um, like in your rib cage and your diaphragm to help you breathe and without those being able to work, you can die. So back to the question of the day. Can eating puffer fish sushi kill you? And the answer is yes, but apparently people still eat this. And so only a certain part of the puffer fish contains TTX. There are certain glands that produce it. So if your chef knows what they're doing and they know what parts of the fish to cut out, you'll be okay. But usually on the menu, there's a little asterisk, one of these guys next to it, that has a warning that says something like, eating this could potentially kill you. So I'd be like, no thank you, but maybe it tastes really good. I don't know. Um, so I'll write the rest of that out for you. So only a certain part of the puffer fish. Contains TTX. So as long as your chef is skilled, enough while cutting the fish. You will be okay. But like I said, that's going to be a hard pass for me. Oops. My monster can always does that and it drives my students crazy. I must 
I must like squeeze it when I drink it and then when I set it down, it pops back open. So sorry if that noise scared you. All right, let's talk about signal propagation. So that's referring to the action potential moving down the axon. There are two types. You have saltatory conduction and continuous conduction. So with saltatory conduction, this happens in axon covered by the myelin sheaths. With saltatory conduction, the action potentials travel faster. So you're going to want to have saltatory conduction and axons covered in myelin sheaths in places where you need like quick responses. And ions, sodium and potassium, only exchange at the nodes of Ranvier. And so what will happen is these action potentials will leapfrog over these, um, the myelin here, and that allows it to go faster. So myelinated examples, these are like your somatic, excuse me, somatic neurons. Things like body movement. And then continuous conduction happens in axons without myelin sheaths. So the action potential travels slower. And ions must exchange along the entire axon. And places where we see this is where we don't need like quick responses, things like your organs, smooth muscles, like in your digestive system, and glands. It's still going to be a fast response, just not as fast as with the myelin sheaths. So let me draw a little picture here. This would be like an unmyelinated axon here. So in order for the action potential to propagate or move down this axon, it's having action potentials all the way down, one after the other, on little different parts of the axon. If you have a myelinated axon, so here's those insulated cells wrapped around there, it can skip those parts. So that's going to happen faster, boom, 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 then boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it's got the boom, booms going on here. All right, we're almost there. I hope you guys are good. Can you leave that there for a second in case you're not done? You don't necessarily need to draw this. That was just my weird way of explaining it. Last page, the synapse. Signal relay at the synapse. So the synapse here, is the connection between the axon end and the target cell. So this is the end of your axon, called the axon terminal, and this little space between here and whatever cell it's trying to act on, whether it's a, a receptor cell or another neuron that it's passing the impulse onto, there's this little space between them and that's called the synapse. So, so the gap that exists between the two cells, sorry, is called the synaptic cleft.
So an action potential, when it gets to the end of that axon terminal, and again, in phys, you go way more into this, but it stimulates the release of a neurotransmitter from the axon terminal into the synaptic cleft. And now you have a chemical, that neurotransmitter, that relays signal, relays the signal. to the next neuron in line. And so you're gonna have all of these neurotransmitters getting released here and passed to the next neuron or to the receptor cell or whatever it is. But if you want the signal to ever stop, you have to eliminate that neurotransmitter. And so in the synaptic clefts here, you have enzymes that break down the neurotransmitters. Or the sending neuron can reabsorb them. And so there are a lot of drugs that have the mechanism of action here at the synaptic cleft, at the, at the synapse, um, because these neurotransmitters, the, the drugs can increase them, they can decrease them, they can block them, they can mimic them. So for example, caffeine blocks neurotransmitters that make you sleepy. So you're gonna, you're gonna stay awake because it's blocking those neurotransmitters. Xanax increases the neurotransmitters that make you sleepy, which is why it relaxes you. Prozac prevents the removal of neurotransmitters that improve mood. So you're gonna have more of those happy neurotransmitters there to, to chemically balance your brain, keep you happy. If you're familiar with SSRIs, it stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. I know all about those. And um, meth, which I don't know about, <laughs> mimics a neurotransmitter that causes a pleasure, pleasure sensation, which is why people like to use it. Some people like to use it. Okay, I'm feeling awkward now. All right. That's the end for today. We will move on to nervous system part two next time, and we'll see you then.